Good evening. I'd like to call to order the um, February 12th, 2013 session of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Welcome uh, my colleagues and welcome members of the audience both here and at home. Um, if we take a look at the agenda, you'll notice that while it is brief, it is one of the most important agendas that we can address during the course of the year. And so um, we certainly want to devote as much attention and focus as we can to these items. Um, I also want to point out that at the conclusion of our regular session, um, we will have an executive session for purposes of discussing strategy with respect to uh, the superintendent's contract to collective bargaining as authorized by Mass General Law Chapter 30A, <coughs> Section 21.3, and to discuss the discipline or dismissal of a public employee or staff member as authorized by Mass General Law Chapter A, Section 21, Paragraph 1. I invite members of the committee to take a brief look at the agenda. Um, I believe that um, 3A is going to be uh, eliminated, is that correct? Yes, I'm not doing updates tonight. 3A, the update time. will be eliminated, so our primary focus this evening is going to be on uh, the FY14 budget. Um, at this point... Oh. No, I'm sorry, the superintendent's update will not happen, oh. but the second quarter budget update will happen. Oh, will be. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I made oh, okay. scribbles okay. coming out. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I apologize. I will entertain a motion to accept the minutes for January 12th, 2013 uh, meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Motion from Catherine, seconded by Lawrence. Any discussion of the minutes from January 12th? Not hearing any. All those in favor of accepting the amendments as present, excuse me, the minutes as presented, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Abstention? I'm for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's unanimous. Uh, a little belated, but it's unanimous. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of January 22nd, 2013. So moved. Second? Second. Second from Annie. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. Minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you very, very much. Um, any announcements? Um, there are some members of the public out there, although I think most of the members of the public are associated or affiliated with one or more public um, committees. Um, is there anyone there in the audience who would care to make a public comment at this particular point in time? Not hearing any then, we will move right along um, to um, item 3A the second quarter budget update. Okay, so this is the update on the FY13 budget. How are we doing midway? Pretty well. So um, a lot of this you saw in the first quarter report because that's when we got our first sense of uh, how things were breaking. Um, I'll just point out a few of the highlights. Um, salaries are scheduled to come in slightly under budget. Um, there's been some shifting around there. Uh, contracted payroll is showing 77,000 available, but we anticipate to use that before the end of the year, uh, typically how it flows. Um, substitutes at this point are running about 8,000 over budget, and that can vary between the end of the year depending on whether the flu strikes or you know, whatever happens. Um, in expenses, uh, special education is now looking at 122,000 over budget. 
You'll see a third line there for expenses. And that's a combination of things. Um, in, in part, it's uh, out-of-district tuitions. Uh, and in part, it's um, um, legal settlements, excuse me. Um, so together, that's about $330,000 over budget. Now, other accounts in special education are running under budget to kind of balance that off. Um, so at this point, we're just looking at about 122000 over budget. Could change between now and then, but this is kind of a heads up. This is where we need some extra uh, budget support. Uh, following by other programs, currently 101000 under budget, likely to stay there, and it's almost entirely due to vocational tuitions. We had an interesting... Uh, um, movement out of vocational schools this year. So I included here what our projections were, were uh, for, uh, for FY13 budget. We're looking at 41 students in um, uh, VOC. Um, some started off the year, uh, in fact. It was, I forget, it was the first quarter was down a little bit. But since then, a number of kids have transferred out of VOC schools. And so as of the uh, December numbers, um, they're running seven and a half FTEs lower than we expected. So that's freeing up $101,000 right there. So that's good news. Um, utilities, also under budget by about 118 as best we can figure. Um, and you've heard this before uh, in terms of um, doing some good contracting for electricity, um, oil, <coughs> and natural gas savings with the conversions. So that's a good piece. Transportation. We're thinking it's going to be a little bit over budget uh, because of cost and maintenance and fuel. Risk and benefits. This is another interesting place. Uh, projected to finish 192,000 under budget. So health insurance is under budget by 73,000. 36 of which got picked up by Ed Jobs funding that we thought had been used up last year, but was revitalized this year. So that helped. Uh, with this year's funding, um, and then with um, less than anticipated enrollment. And we talked about this in the first quarter report that uh, I think the new health care regime may be delaying some of our younger staff to pick up their own uh, insurance policies. So um, we've had the transfer from GIC and retirees, um, but overall it looks like we're going to be finishing 192000 under budget for insurance. So <coughs> we talked about in the first quarter that we used 20000 from the uh, special reserve from e and <coughs> to fund the regionalization study. So that's, we talked about that. But to sum it up as of this point, um, we have positive budget variances of 101000 in other programs, in other words, VOC. 118,000 utilities, 192,000 in risk and benefits. For a total of $411,000, we can repurpose for other uses. Now, that's offset by an additional 150,000 in special ed legal settlements. So we really have 261 to think of other ways to use. And what we're doing it so far, and you'll see this in our budget presentation for next year, we can use 112,000 of that to prepay retirement incentives that otherwise would be paid out of next year's budget. And we can prepay $100,000 of special ed tuition costs for the summer uh, tuitions um, that would then alleviate uh, the FY14 budget. And that would still leave at this point 50,000 to go into e and which is pretty much what we'd been planning all along. Um, and hopefully, it'll end up being a little bit better than that. So, you know, things swing back and forth. <laughs> this, this year, things have gone really well for the region, allowing us to do some help for next year. And um, it's looking very positive. Any questions? Yep. So, paying forward like that, was that, was that already, that wouldn't have already been calculated in the 600 and something thousand shortfall? No, no. 
So that would help to kind of. That's right. It's gonna, definitely going to help, and you'll see that when we get to the 14 budget. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Can Thank you, you very much, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I like it swinging a little bit more, actually. We're, we're okay. We'll see where we land. Okay. Um, before we move on to um, the, 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 the heart of the meeting, um, I just want to remind people that warrants are coming around. Um, <laughs> once again, remind that your cars are under lock and key until you sign them, so <laughs> please make sure you do so. Maria. Thank you. <coughs> for you. And there are some for audience members. If I don't know if uh, maybe if Debbie you want to pass. Here's for here's for audience kids. Yes. Most people in the audience have have viewed this already. So um, so at the um, also, Rob has some updated pages that toward the end of my presentation, he's going to give you some updated data based on what you're going to see on the slides. So we'll have that information for you with questions and answers as well. So um, tonight is our FY14 uh, proposed budget and the public hearing portion. Um, in terms of the public hearing, we typically hear from people in the audience up front, and then we also receive many emails and feedback after people have the opportunity to kind of review and think through. And then we really have a period of time, which I think is approximately a month, before we go to the point of asking the committee to vote. Um, again, it's really important to say that this process is still very fluid, that there's new information around the financial status that comes in over time. We also um, have students registering for classes, so enrollments shift in cla specific classes, but also our enrollment, we watch closely over time for the next few months. And then we also have the opportunity to hear from our four towns, our four communities on uh, March 2nd, where the four towns are able to give us input and feedback about um, where they're sitting financially and are they able to support the level of assessments that we're asking um, at this time. So um, for those of you who are in Amherst, you'll see a bit of redundancy from our last budget presentation, but I think it's important to kind of set the stage for all of us when we're thinking about where we are in the budget process. Uh, let's see if this works for me. No. I don't know. <laughs> oh, probably. No, it is. No, it's not. Thank you. Can't see that little, those little letters. Nothing about my age at all. <laughs> okay, so starting um, with a brief overview, this information was presented the last time we met. Again, we're very um, pleased and um, that we've had the support of our four communities of our regional budget. Um, in particular, the periods of time that I've been here, it's been a very supportive process. And while the, the, each of the communities are sitting in, um, you know, a financial struggle and their own fiscal realities of how do they support their elementary schools and their town um, services, they have been able to support our regional schools. And the, you'll see what those averages have been over a period of time. And our challenge has been really to maintain the, the valuable services, the wonderful programming we have in place with a, what I would consider a, a low increase of 2.1% average um, yearly. And at the same time, it's important that we're making educational improvements at, and um, we're responding to our changing student demographic. So again, for the past five years, we've been in this situation. We've had these conversations. We have made reductions. Um, we have uh, tried to maintain um, our programs and we've gone for the model of what um, I think Mark Jackson started using the term a number of years ago of constricting versus cutting out programs that we value. However, it is important to, to note that there have been um, programs that have been cut um, over the course of the past five years. So our current challenges for FY14 and for the future, again, just to remind the community as well as the committee, we have um, tried to really be conscious of feathering out the use of stimulus funds over a number of years so that we didn't feel as much of a cliff as some other communities have felt. Um, but we are seeing a significant reduction in um, our grant funding, which is part of the stimulus package, which um, supports our budget beyond what the towns have um, provided. We also have um, 
realized a, a, a decline in our availability, the availability of and the support by not only our entitlement grants, but our competitive grants, where we are not um, as eligible for many of those grants in the current environment. Um, also, clearly, everyone is recognizing the sluggish economic growth at the state level, which we are not able to realize what was common in the 1990s, which was a very different level of support, financial support for our schools. And we um, are in the midst of a, and have been, a significant level of declining enrollment, which is, again, fairly consistent across the state of Massachusetts. But we um, illustrated that the last time we met, and I will show that again tonight just to really um, stress that point. Um, chapter 70, State Aid, again, I would describe as um, flat. Um, and we have fixed costs that we need to um, be attentive to, which are the, the charter um, aid formula, which we talked about last time. And there's a lot of detail in your um, comprehensive spending plan. There's some information in there for you to review um, if you'd like more information. But charter is a substantial cost. We have retirement costs, um, which are kind of legacy costs, and we have contractual obligations. So those are some things that are in place that we have to um, keep our eye on. So um, again, the visual of um, the scale and where we're sitting at this point in terms of a gap. So um, this again, this is really a challenging process when you're building a budget for a complicated uh, system, a school system, and one that's primarily comprised of human beings. It's never an easy uh, undertaking. And this process takes us months. Um, we really began by looking at our October 1 counts, and we, we move on from then. Um, we start with looking at, again, our student demographic changes as of October 1. Uh, we also look at our student achievement scores around the same time uh, from the prior year. What are our group needs of students and what are the individual needs that we're aware of? We also um, have to make sure that we're paying attention to the individual mandated services for children um, in special education and ELL, um, McKinney-Vento, and other services that are required by law. Uh, we also have um, to really take a look at what our projected enrollments are for the following year and look at that over multiple years. We need to, um, again, be very conscious of what efficiencies we can realize. And as you saw Rob just point out in the second quarter um, um, update, mm -hmm. that we are realizing those savings based on some of the efficiencies that have been put in place, um, which we um, are very appreciative of. And we have to be real with what are our known costs. Um, you know, after a certain period of time, you can look at the history of various lines of what does it take for cleaning supplies for a school, and you can be pretty sure um, what we will be predicting for the following year. So we really need to look at our trends and to be real with budgeting. Otherwise, we end up falling short, um, which is never a smart plan. Um, so this is kind of where we are now. And again, we want to keep our eye on where do we want to be. So we spend, have spent our time reviewing our mission, vision, and our core beliefs. Um, it, this becomes more critically important when we are in tough financial times. It's what do we consider core for our, our schools, for our students, for our programs and services. We review the guidance that's been provided by the school committee that we've discussed and um, voted. We also revisit our district improvement plan um, and school improvement plans and these, um, the guidance um, as, a, as a whole. And we need to consider not only are we trying to make reductions, and we're, we're also trying to, as I mentioned before, move forward. So we need to be conscious of our current goals, which um, highlighting some for you tonight, we have the implementation of a data plan to inform instruction. We have a sig significant amount of work to do in that area, which is the rollout plan for next school year. And that's just the begin of, beginning of the process. We um, have a need to put in place a systemic family and community engagement um, um, process um, plan that is not uh, discrete interventions, but really a much more holistic um, strategic approach to family engagement because we clearly are not at this time uh, making meaningful connections with all of our families. Um, and we know what the research has really talked to us about. Um, one of the strong predictors of strong student achievement is to really make the strong connections and partnering with families. We also have a, a substantial amount of work to do um, in terms of our internal curricular alignment and our alignment to the common core. 
and um, we need to really pay attention to our tiered instructional um, what do we have in place currently? What do we need to put in place so that we are targeting instruction and filling gaps and moving all students forward? And we need to look at differentiation, not only for students who are struggling academically, but students who are prepared for more, um, um, more <coughs> extension, more rigor. Um, also, we are in the midst of um, implementation of the educator evaluation model, and next year is the next phase of that implementation, which is, um, I think, honestly the the more complex stage which is really looking at how are we um, using student achievement data to factor into um, the evaluation of, of all of us and this is something very new for educators it's very new for administrators so this will take um, a substantial amount of work and we also will be um, having input from surveys as part of these evaluations so there's a substantial amount of, of work to do over this year so that we are prepared to implement for next year um, and we also are continuing to look at models for embedded professional development, realizing that having our staff go out for, to a workshop and then coming back in isolation and not having um, their colleagues having the same conversations around um, ways to improve their practice is not necessarily the best model. So we're trying to um, consider ways to build time and structured um, collaboration time for our professionals so that we can not only improve instruction, but with the goal being improved student outcomes. So these are our commitments, um, and we want to make sure we're staying true to those commitments when we're having to make difficult decisions. So um, while we're doing this, and I know I have to always put um, students in the picture, they're not the little <coughs> students any longer, but um, we're considering the students right now in front of us. Um, I could have put Zoe up there, but I didn't have a picture, Zoe. Um, but she's here, so we can keep her in, in our forefront. So um, it's critically important. So um, uh, Rob will hand out um, to the committee um, a detailed uh, list at the end, too, that we can go through, which has um, budget additions, adjustments, uh, the specific budget adds, and the specific budget cuts with the dollar amounts factored. So I will give you that as well for, for um, at the end of this where we can go through, which will be the insert into your binder. Uh, but I would like to go over and take the time to go over some of the specific ads and cuts now. Um, so um, when we are um, facing a gap, which our last figure was around $900,000, that gap will be a little bit different tonight because I've asked to apply additional E&D, which is our excess and deficiency, our reserves, to bring that down to about $800,000-ish, which we'll see that exact number. It's $843,575. Um, when we're really looking at that level of reduction, we need to ask ourselves questions when we're engaging in this process. So we need to consider where are the declining enrollments represented and where can we make some reductions just based on declining enrollments. Is a cut or an ad consistent with our district improvement plan priorities? We have to be really explicit with asking ourselves that question. What is the FTE, um, the full-time equivalent of a staff person? What is that? What is necessary to actually schedule a building? And we also um, have to ask ourselves: How do we maintain the broad range of offerings for our students that we all value? Finding a place where where our students connect and feel. Um, excited about coming to school during the day and what drives them, what they're passionate about, while we decrease our expenses. Can you explain the third one? I don't get that. Sure. It's when we're looking at, and I think Mickey, when she's looking at actual scheduling, you have to consider um, what percentage or what part of an English person. Um, staff member is needed to actually schedule English and much of that is actually dependent upon um, the numbers of students who are coming in for that grade level there's some knowns about what courses students will take in ninth grade and some are based on actual students signing up for so the numbers when we go into the uh, reductions um, Mickey who schedules for um, the high school and and Mike and Betsy for the middle school they can make some assumptions based on knowing that the numbers of students who will be entering is X number again that sways based on are there more kids entering than we predicted um, what do students actually sign up for uh, but that is what is actually necessary um, to build a schedule so we move from and the high schools vary I think high schools in general 
that's how they build their world. Elementary, it's it's kind of a new phenomena for us at the elementary level because we have had, you know, um, and it's been conversations out there, so I'll put it out there too. So, for example, um, we might have one art teacher, one phys ed teacher, one music teacher at the school level, at the elementary level. And now when you have declining resources, you really need to think about, so how many sections or how many classrooms do I have? And how many FTE or pieces of people do I need? Do I need a full-time person? Or should that be a 0.8 or 0.6? Or do I need 1.5? So those are the conversations we have about allocation of staff, not only for specific <coughs> classrooms, but also special education, ELL, um, paraprofessional support. And this is the process that we take on at this point um, when, uh, actually, about a month ago when Mickey and um, Betsy and, and Mike and Mark were looking at what the current numbers are looking like. Does that help? Okay. Kind of long-winded answer. Okay, so um, also, um, as I mentioned, um, in this case, the, the question always comes up to is how much reserves and how much choice funds can we apply to the budget? So you will see when I have hand, hand out um, your insert, I've asked Rob to apply an additional $100,000 of E&D. The question is, um, how much can you apply, knowing how much you will be hopefully putting back into that reserve at the end of a school year? We know fairly conservatively 50000 and um, I'm banking on more. Um, that's my optimism, um, to replenish that use of reserves, because we want to make sure that the decisions we're making leave us financially um, sound. Um, so it's kind of the, the amount of how much can you use. And you're also building a cliff in the future if your choice reduces the number of choice students you take in or um, you draw down your E&D. So it's, it's a, a very careful, I think, dance and um, determinations before we're, or while we're actually making reductions. So um, to go right into um, the ads and cuts, I just want to remind us of what the declining enrollment looked like and looks like. Um, and again, this includes choice students. Um, so we see the steady decline um, over time. And um, it's the first question we, we ask ourselves is what are those natural reductions? Knowing how many students are coming into the high school, what sections are reduced? So um, now I'm gonna go into the uh, specific ads and cuts and um, I'll speak to those and if there are specific questions, we'll take those at the end as well. So um, when we're looking at academic reductions, so at the high school, you can see there's a 0.5 projected um, reduction in English, a 1.0 in social studies, a 0.2 in prep academy, a 0.4 in mathematics, and a 0.2 in science. All of these reductions are proportional based on the declining enrollment, so it's the natural reduction based on the numbers of students coming in. Fewer sections we're offering rather than cutting offerings, so we are not cutting um, programming out. We are consolidating or reducing um, the sections being offered. And the class sizes in this remain relatively stable. Again, those numbers we check over time because if our projections are more students are coming in, then it will affect class size. But right now our class sizes are not increasing with these reductions. And in terms of an additional academic reduction, we have 1.0 teacher from Southeast Campus, which is our in-district day placement, which is based on actual student enrollments. We are reducing one of the classroom teachers. But again, the class size in this um, scenario remains relatively stable. For electives, the reductions are as follows, 0.2 Chinese, uh, 0.6 Family Consumer Science, 0.2 physical education, 0.4 performing arts, and 0.2 technology education. Again, all reductions are proportional based on declining enrollment. There'll be fewer sections offered and consolidation of levels in some cases, which I think is uh, primarily in the performing arts and the arts, um, and rather than cutting offerings. So again, this does not cut offerings for students, and the class sizes, again, remain <coughs> fairly stable. At the middle school, you'll see a reduction of 1.0 class uh, computer teacher. This means that the teacher um, will no longer, technology will no longer be offered on the specials rotation. 
So now it is a matter of integration of technology into classrooms and the technology paraprofessional remains to provide support. But we will not have that as an offering on a rotational schedule for middle school students. And um, a 1.0 phys ed reduction at the middle school, which is a reduction of physical education instructional time. Um, we are considering, and this we're very in the beginning of how we're going to um, address some of the needs that we've identified about increasing the amount of health instruction that our students require. So we may be adding um, back additional health sections. And um, what this reduction means is approximately 54 hours of physical education will be provided per year, which is every other day, no, twice per week, um, for half of a year is how we're thinking about it at the moment. And the amount of uh, phys ed time is consistent with our elementary school physical education time. Um, some of the, the considerations around this um, reduction specifically as we looked at different middle schools locally but also in the eastern part of the state to consider how are they addressing, um, how are they addressing phys ed. So some have it on a rotation, which is what um, we're suggesting, you know, with a similar format of what we're suggesting happen next year. Um, some have it consistent with what we're doing right now, which is more phys ed time over the course of a year. Um, and the one thing that kind of this uh, checking has um, really made us aware of solidly is that we have to have more dedicated time for health. So again, we're trying to, at this point, look at our scheduling and figure out, figuring out how we maintain and increase health as well as maintaining um, the physical education. So also, the other thing that's important to point out, again, it's, it's a scheduling challenge that when we, similar to some of the Amherst um, and, and Pelham um, conversations around schedule and what you can fit during a school day, um, when we looked at other middle, some of the other middle schools, um, they have um, much reduced um, instruction in music and um, world language. So again, it's the challenge that we have of not, at this point, we do not want to reduce um, those offerings to students. Um, and again, how do you fit it all in during a school day? So this is where we are sitting at the moment. Much more work to be um, done over the next month or so before we come back in front of you around the phys eds and health specifically. Additional reductions for administrative and support. Um, there is a .8 student services administrator reduction. You saw the, for the Amherst um, um, members, you saw the .2 reduction in Amherst. So this is a 1.0 reduction. We will have to set aside some funds for offset for summer stipends um, to cover the special education summer services and summer school, which are mandated. And we need to have staff on to be able to um, provide the support to students. Um, but we, that's still um, in discussion of, of how we will address those needs. But again, it is an administrative reduction of 1.0 total, 0.8 to the region. Point two, we're reducing our webmaster and our administrative and clerical staff will take on additional cleric, uh, support of um, the web working with um, Jerry Champagne and IS. Uh, we are also reducing a part-time van driver, um, a point two ELE coordinator, a 1.0 clerical secretary position at the middle school, and a 1.0 coordinator position from Southeast Campus. Related to the Southeast Campus, um, if you'll remember, um, we had a person placed at Southeast Campus this year as the principal. So at this point, um, the decision is to reduce the coordinator under that principal, and the principal will need to assume greater responsibilities. So um, those are the administrative and support reductions. Additional reductions realized right now is 1.5 paraprofessionals, and we're really still in the process of determining whether this will be a general education reduction or special education um, reduction, and much of this is based on service delivery and um, the, the discussions we'll have over the next month. Also, at the middle school, there is a reduction of, I should have put middle school there, um, 1.0 internal suspension teacher. We've had a um, 
a licensed staff person in internal suspension for the past few years. Prior to that, we had a paraprofessional supporting um, the Quiet Learning Center, and we are moving back to the paraprofessional support model. Um, with, um, and I'll go to the additions that um, we referenced a, a little bit um, the last time we met. When we go through the ads and cuts, when Rob hands those out, you can see where there are some additional reductions, such as prepaying the special education tuitions for July and August, some of them for $100,000, prepaying some of the retirement incentives, $117,000. We did not have a sabbatical request, which is a $30,000 reduction. Um, and then there's some um, staff turnover savings factored in when we have uh, staff come and go there's a, typically a certain amount of savings so you'll see those things re, um, reflected because of course we want to um, look at anything that is a non a staff person non person before we're going to the, the point of reducing people again we're being very conscious of the fact that um, we're, when we're talking about the level of, of cuts that we have in place, we're talking about multiple people being affected by this. This may be a full person reduction. It may be a part of a person reduction. It may be um, a different staff assignment. Um, so these changes, these reductions touch multiple, um, multiple people in their lives. So, um, the additions that we have in place are two at this moment, and I don't foresee any additional additions. Um, we have built in some stipend funds for the transition from middle school so that we have some support for scheduling for the uh, for this summer. Uh, we also have built in the 1.0 Steps to Success liaison that I rec uh, referenced the last time we met, which is um, a position which addresses the need to have a systemic approach to family and um, uh, uh, engagement and to really create a, a comprehensive achievement program for income eligible families. Um, this includes um, a range of services and supports. It's modeled after the Brookline program that um, Rick and some other staff members went to review um, a few months ago and the group is going back in March um, in, ex in an expanded group to really create a model program. There's one FTE built into the region and one built into the elementary schools and these are teacher level positions um, to support making stronger connections with families who at this point are underserved in our schools. Um, and um, really wanting to make the connection here too with the MSAN students and the programming and STRIVE and some of the mentoring that we would like to expand between high school students going to middle school students and then going to elementary students and really creating a strong pipeline of support for our students who um, in many cases we are um, not serving terribly well. So this is um, I think putting at this point um, resources toward our commitment. So, um, in summary, um, and again, we'll look more at the details and, and answer lots of questions. We, are, we have at this point, our goal is really to be maintaining reasonable class sizes, and at this point, they're consistent with the class sizes given our enrollment projections that we currently have in place. So we are not tipping the scales of increasing at this moment, again, the, the the enrollments of our students will dictate to a certain degree the class sizes that we will have in place. Um, but we are um, fortunate that we are maintaining what we value, which is the team model at the middle school, which is a developmentally sound model, which helps to support students coming from the elementary environment and experience going toward the high school um, environment. And we are maintaining that and the class sizes that correspond so that students are held well within a smaller community within a community. We are also maintaining the majority of our elective offerings. Um, our reductions were realized when at all possible based on our declining enrollments. Um, so the FTE portions in most cases were based on um, our enrollment figures that we represented just a little while ago in that dramatic dip. And the reductions and additions are consistent with our district priorities. 
while difficult, they are consistent with where we want to be and need to be as a school system. So um, some of our next steps, um, we need to look at scheduling and we need to look at how we're effectively utilizing the staff that we have. We are going to be um, and are in the process of examining our service delivery models for special education and English learner education. We're exploring our service delivery model for intervention, um, which is for a general education students and special education students, and how are we meeting the needs to, uh, of our students who are struggling, and how are we filling gaps so that they are able to um, make progress at um, a higher rate, hopefully, than um, in the past, and really want to be able to move students forward. Uh, we also want to create and implement uh, steps for greater differentiation within the classroom. And again, I reference students who are struggling academically and students who are, great, are, are ready for greater challenge. We need to be able to, within a classroom, meet the needs of all of our learners. And that is um, that takes great skill, um, professional development, and lots of practice, um, as, especially when we have a changing student demographic. We also, um, again, want to create opportunities for our staff to be engaged in ongoing professional development, in embedded professional development. Um, and we are going to explore schedules and structures in general to provide ample and consistent <laughs> instructional time over the course of the school year. So we're really looking at how we are using our time. Um, and the longer range question that I referenced last time is how do we create a school system that maintains what we value and we consider core <coughs> within um, um, the new fiscal reality and we don't want to be in the position where every year we're faced with cuts we want to be able to be much more strategic and over time create a system that supports what we value supports our students and allows us to um, be fiscally responsible um, so again, our conversations will be about what is core and one of this, the side conversations that we have to have when we're identifying what is core is how are we going to um, use choice or not. And I think that's an ongoing, that's a future conversation that we're going to be engaged in um, shortly. Um, so a couple things I did um, just want to mention too from the last time that we met. Um, so I have some of the information that people asked about. One was in terms of special education. You know, we're realizing a declining enrollment in our student population. Are we realizing a declining number of special education students, not just the percentage? So when we took a look today, if we looked at October of 2004, we had 1,855 students enrolled, and we had 298 special education students. In October of 2012, we have 1,527 students um, enrolled total, and we have 320 special education students. So we are not seeing a corresponding decrease in um, the special education um, population as we're seeing in our general enrollments. Also, if we look at income eligible students, um, those numbers are steadily increasing. So if we start looking in 2005, we had 306 students who were income eligible, um, and I can give you the enrollments in general. Um, in October of 2011, we had 385. In October 2012, we have 407 students. So we're not seeing a decrease in um, populations consistent, these identified populations consistent with our declining enrollment. Um, I will look at some of the other side questions people had was around the level of need of special education students and how has that shifted over time. I don't have that information for you tonight. Um, and I do want to hand out, because there's been questions um, around um, administrative costs that typically comes up, and it does come up every time that we talk about budget cuts because it's extremely difficult for everyone to think about making cuts that are <laughs> close to students. So the conversation around administrative cuts comes up each year, and I wanted to kind of give a little bit of context, that's a few different copies, um, for you just to have uh, for your reference. So just kind of, um, again, we also had a per pupil um, study conducted in Amherst this year, so that, that information is on our webpage that you can look under reports and find 
um, the PowerPoint presentation as well as the per pupil um, cost and where administration sits in terms of our comparison districts. And um, based on the analysis this year, the per pupil, um, the cost for administrators sat kind of smack right in the middle of the 14, 12 or 14 comparison districts. So I wanted to mention that. Also, I wanted to mention that this study was, I think Debbie pulled information together, it was last, last, February. last February as well, which we can provide the committee with the full report. But I wanted to give people just a snapshot and just make a couple comments. So um, to be really, you know, kind of be very clear, <coughs> there's been one administrative ad um, in the past year. And um, there are no additional administrative ads next year. Um, if you look back 10 years ago, 2002, 2003, um, this gives you a bit of a snapshot of who it directly um, was re directly reporting to the superintendent. <coughs> and there were 13 people who reported directly to the superintendent. Um, also, there were 13 administrators or assistant principals, which was a total of 28 FTE total. So that was 10 years ago. And there's been varied um, uh, pictures of the administrative structure, which I gave you a few snapshots, and I gave you currently. So the, the reporting to the superintendent directly has remained somewhat stable between 13 and 14 people over time. Um, this year, there are 14 people directly reporting to me as an administration, um, and they're non-unit directors um, and princi uh, principals. Um, and there are nine administrators, assistant principals um, in the tier two of administrative support, if you want to talk about tiers. Mm -hmm. So um, 10 years ago, we had 28 total FTE. Today, we have 23 total FTE. And I think it's important um, to really note that while, um, and, it, and it's difficult to represent this to the community because administration is really not, um, unless you're working in that environment, it's not easy to understand what are all the components that go into supporting a school district separate from what we all know as teachers and walking through school ourselves. But since um, in the past, you know, 10 years or so, while there's been no substantial increase in any way of our administrative structure, and there's actually been less, the mandates from the state and the requirements for the administrative roles is about a 300% increase. So when we look at things like data collection, progress reporting, reporting on various um, discipline rates, dropout rates, um, staffing reports, licensure requirements, um, special education through IDEA, um, the requirements for general education for tiered instruction. English learner education is going through another massive change right now, which we don't really even fully know what those requirements will be next year. Um, we have the educator evaluation system, just no child left behind in general. Um, the common core uh, requirements of adjustment to um, that for us currently, race to the top, and then general compliance and oversight. So um, again, I know we've had this conversation every year about the administrative structure, but I do want to just give you updated information because I know those questions come from the community and they're, you know, justified questions and I think it's, it's something that um, we need to respond to. Do you know the difference, um, the differential over the course of years between the lower paid staff and the administrators would essentially be the higher staff between 2002-03 and now? Because that's yeah. it's numbers, but it's also salary level. Sure. I mean, I can go back and look at um, some probably, I don't know if I can have, I might have those, I'm not sure I have assignments of what people were paid 10 years ago. I probably can find that. The higher paid staff are typically the non-unit staff, which are the 14 versus the, the 13 10 years ago. That's varied between um, 13 and 14 each year. They typically are the higher paid. Um, and then because the assistant principals and um, administrators are in a, uh, they're a unit within a, a contract. So we can go back easily and look at kind of where that uh, sat. Um, and I sat in one of those roles 10 years ago too, so I know where I sat um, financially. So yeah, we're more than happy to. 
And we also, I think in this report, we also have comparisons of the administrative roles compared to other districts in the salaries. So mm -hmm. it shows the number of um, districts that have similar administrative structures. And it's like a checklist. You have this person or you don't have this person. And then there's a comparison of other districts and the salaries compared to our districts. So this, this I can actually, I'd be happy to send out to the committee as in its entirety. Mm -hmm. But I wanted you to just kind of have this because I know people are asking questions. Is it, are, the, are the comparables Western Mass or statewide? Um, there's some Western Mass and there is some statewide. So we have both. And the same thing when the per pupil for Amherst, we had some locals and we had um, school districts that had a more similar demographic because again it's difficult for us to find a community that has um, the sim a similar structure with multiple districts and that has the same demographics because when you look at even like I don't know if it was Framingham has more of the closer demographics to us but it's a very different system so it's um, it's interesting when you look at all the information together so I'd be happy to send out for the committee this report and also the per pupil I th think you probably received that but I'll send that out again uh, for Amherst um, which does reference the region and um, the PowerPoint just so people have the information to answer questions so that's on the awesome. reports page on the website yeah it's all on the website um, yeah. for the community as well uh, <laughs> but I'd be happy to make sure you don't have to dig for it yeah, I, and um, when you do the comparison districts, um, are they are they central office staff that are administering to three districts, multiple districts? Um, majority, no, but the some who are are typically smaller systems. So it's hard, again, and the demographics are really different. So you can make some comparison. Like I think it's, it was very hard, even with the person who was um, doing the study for us, it was hard to find an apples to apples comparison. But, statements kind of weird but they, it was really difficult for them to find um, similar systems uh, do you want any questions now or do you just want to continue no I'm up? actually uh, that was just my update like to give people additional information that I thought was either coming up or that people asked last time so I'm fine with taking questions okay. and then I also have um, Mickey Diane Mark Betsy here for um, school-based questions that I might not be able to articulate well enough for the committee <clears throat> How did um, the idea of co-principals and the interim principal model come up to have two people in the higher tier salary rather than co-principals, one in the lower tier salary? You know, that was, um, I'm trying to think about the co-principals, one that came up that was before my... Um, yeah. So that was prior to my time, but it was how many years ago? Was it on here? Yeah. So it was like from. Yeah. And I think it's gone through that iteration a couple times. The first time I see a co principal is 2011 and 2012, yeah. right? Yeah, and then there was in. Hmm? Middle school had it. Middle school had it twice, I believe. Right. If I'm well, remembering the correctly. Had. And the yeah. high school did once as well. Yeah. Yes. And again, it was turnover. I'm sorry. Trevor, did you have a follow-up to that? Or? <clears throat> no, I mean, it just seems that um, the two points of fact that this higher tier salary that are non-unit um, negotiating mm -hmm. salaries are the mm -hmm. highest tier, and if we're talking about what you're describing, you know, uh, people in the community asking mm -hmm. why so many administrators, right. it seems if there's a vacancy for, co for a assistant principal mm -hmm. that is on a lower tier, that vacancy is empty, but we have two, a double, you know, uh, occupancy of the principalship, which is a higher salary. Mm -hmm. And it just seems, you know, just from a layman's perspective, sure. that doesn't seem to make financial sense. Sure. Are you talking currently or the past ones? I'm talking each. In, in either case, yeah. in the past, it wouldn't seem to make sense, or currently, it wouldn't seem to make sense. Yeah, it sir. seems like you're paying two people yeah. more money than you would pay one person yeah. right off the bat. Yeah. And you have a, a vacancy in a lower tier position, an assistant principal. So you got two people doing the job of principal and nobody doing the job of assistant principal. Right. And um, typically what happens is that if you have two co-principals, mm -hmm. they divide the responsibilities of the principals and the assistant principals. And it's often a situation where there is a, an, a quick vacancy and then two people say, 
we'll both step up and help, but it's not like one person's going for the job necessarily. So it's kind of like how do you fill a, a gap quickly? So the offset might be maybe a, a $10,000, $20,000 offset, but it's often to have some consistency, the better model to go in a short term and then to go back to. Um, you know, a principal and an assistant principal. So it's very specific to the situation, but it's often when you have a quick decision to make. So is that one of the things we're considering to go back to and try to save a twenty thousand dollars is the word you just the number you just put forth that that might be the override that it would cost to fill both of them? Uh, we, we don't do? have right now um, mm -hmm. two co principals in the region. I thought Pell I, mean, I mean Crocker. Yeah, yeah Crocker Farm has two principals. We are we are in the process right now of hiring a principal for Crocker That's right. Farm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Rick? Just a detailed question. I was asked about grants manager. If you mm -hmm. look at the line item budget in region, it looks like it's an increase of twenty grand and for Amherst I think eighty grand. Mm -hmm. But was that a move from one department into another? Yes, and what happened is we have um, we have two people who have hands on grants management. Um, one what is not a full time position; it's like a point, maybe point three, because the person also is the out of school time coordinator. Right now, both of those are showing up in that line, so there is no increase for um, grants manager at all next year. It's just a reaccounting, so it's showing up in a line that. Yeah. We don't have a place to put at this moment the out of school time coordinator. Um, so, and what you'll see on the, I shouldn't talk specific people, but we're ending up with the same FTE of grants managers next year, so there is no increase. Mm -hmm. And not, part of that question was what does the grants manager do? So the grant manager is has a function um, in the business office um, as well as working with the educational directors. So the grants managers work with the directors to write grants, which are not only entitlement grant, I mean um, competitive grants that you may go for each year, but it's also we have um, each year we, we resubmit for our entitlement grants. So there's a level of working with the administrators to make sure that we are writing our grants in a way that we will actually be able to implement and meet the needs that are designed by the grant. So they're typically the expert and what are the requirements of the grant to begin with. And then they also have a, a heavy focus on um, oversight compliance because these grants are often very laden with reporting and um, accounting for staff time, so they're responsible for the administrative <coughs> kind of, and these are not administrative positions, they're kind of, yeah, so they, they um, and they also have a reporting function where in terms of the business office, they have to be, you know, watching um, to make sure that we are actually applying the funds in a way that's consistent with um, the requirements of the grant. So there's a whole compliance, oversight, monitoring, um, accounting section of that responsibility as well. So it is um, it's a position school districts typically cannot go without if you have millions of dollars in grants uh, because the management of those grants is, is too challenging. Michael. Um, I have three, I can spread them out. Um, go ahead. The, first, the first two are in the reductions and adjustments. Yeah. Um, with physical education, yeah. um, What's a little surprising slash concerning, given our previous conversations about athletics and obesity and mm -hmm. et cetera, is less about the actual reduction of a teacher, but this is the statement that we're reducing physical education instructional time. Yes, and I we get are. that the, the school day is full, there's not enough time, there's too many mandates, et cetera, but, and we're adding health. So I get all that stuff, but mm -hmm. especially at the middle school where it's already anemic physical education, okay. we're just setting the kids up for being not physical and not incorporating that stuff. So why, yeah. it just is troubling to see that we're reducing it even further. Mm -hmm. I, I would say there's not very much at all to begin with in the middle school, so. It's the number, the amount that we have right now is fairly consistent with um, a certain portion of middle schools that we looked at and it's actually more than um, middle schools that have it in a rotation. It's not a value judgment on that. The question is, how do you maintain world language and music to the degree that we do? Because that would be the trade-off for us. Of, I guess my value judgment would yeah. be that the comparables are that they're not sufficient at this point in time yeah. given societal mm -hmm. stuff going on. Yeah, no, I understand. I would also say that one of the conversations that Betsy and Mike and I have been having is 
to look at a potential increase and how does that play out? Does it play out? In, I mean, a portion of it has to be held and a portion of it is can you schedule other ways that kids are engaging in physical activity during the school day? That one may be a bit less traditional, so it's not necessarily a scheduled phys ed go to the gym class, but there might be some other options. Like them outside? Mm -hmm. Potentially, yeah. What a radical concept. Yeah. Hmm. So that takes us a little bit of time to figure out, but it is a reduction. So I'm not, I don't want to say that it's not, and it's something that we've been struggling with. Michael? Um, the second one of reduction and adjustments is the computer teacher. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it'd be nice to hear more about that. I, you know, I can appreciate that integration of technology into everything is where, you know, things are going in one regard. Right. But on the other hand, especially for middle school, having targeted specific computer technology stuff seems like you cover places and you address it in ways where you're not having to worry about content area. You're actually learning about skills and skill development. So given that the world is moving to more technology, the fact that we'd be reducing that seems odd to me, and I'd like to hear some sure. more about it. I can speak a little bit, and then if Betsy wants to jump in. But I think that the majority of our students coming to the middle school level at this point, their experience with the use of technology is um, at the point where they should be using it to connect to a content area and using it within the classrooms. Um, having an opportunity to learn PowerPoint and those sorts of things devoid of a content um, I think it's it's less than um, I would I think the value is more connect connecting it within the classroom if you're working on a project and you have to con you know have a PowerPoint presentation as part of that to have that opportunity hap happen within our classroom I think sometimes having it in a rotation really doesn't help us to take that next step of pushing it into the classroom which is where it, it truly needs to be in my opinion um, so I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with the, the shift in this way to move toward, we've been trying to move toward integration of technology into the classroom at the elementary level as well, um, but still have maintained it in some cases on the rotation and in some schools off the rotation. Yeah, just to counter, yeah. I mean, uh, my sense is using the Schitt's Creek example, I mean, the kids are learning PowerPoint and doing mm -hmm. book reports in second grade, so they're mm -hmm. already integrating that. My sense would be using that opportunity to actually push it to a much higher level in terms of how you think strategically about using technology or looking at emerging technologies, not about, you know, PowerPoint's mundane at right. this point. Right. Um, I mean, not that that's yeah. your only example. No, no, no. No, and I think that <clears throat> one of the conversations that we've had, and it's going to be, um, we'll see how this plays out in the larger frame, but um, Jerry Champagne and Faye Brady mm -hmm. have presented to us an integration of technology, a plan for integration of technology where you have a cohort or a group of experts around integration at the school level because uh, Faye's belief and Jerry's belief as well, I'm speaking for both of them, is that um, use of technology should not just be for, for children when, when you're identifying a specific special education need or other. It should be about how we are integrating the use of different devices and tools within the classroom. And um, so they have uh, presented to the administrative team a few months ago a plan for a level of integration starting for next school year. So I don't think this is fully a middle school conversation. I think it's a, a systems conversation. But again, it's not defined fully that will, you know, probably allay all of your fears at this moment. But um, that's where we're moving. Yeah. Lawrence, you have a question also? Computer? Yeah, I have yeah. two. But I think go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I Put think you answered. Yeah. So we're, when you're talking about that. Uh, the plan to integrate, mm -hmm. that's to train teachers, that's to have a cohort that will work with their yes. colleagues. And we have um, in our hiring right now an assistive technology uh, staff person who would be expert to be able to work with. And the question is how do you roll this out so that you identify people ideally who are interested in um, mm -hmm. serving this function because you want to grow kind of the energy and the excitement around integration of technology. You don't want to feel like it's something <coughs> that's kind of put upon you. So we have a person who is being hired for that position. We had someone in the position in the past, but it's a more focus around a wider systemic approach to implementation of technology in the classroom. And Faye and Jerry together will be leading that uh, person with working with and developing those cohorts at each school. Yeah. And then it's gonna be able to model within classrooms as well, because again, 
if we say here's the tool and we actually don't show people how to use that or we show people in isolation where it's a PD, it mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't translate, it doesn't right. generalize. Right. So to have the opportunity where a staff person could find out who's expert in the school and say, you know what, I want to use this technology. Can I go and watch someone else do yeah. it? To yeah. have that so that's the plan right. to um, implement in a more meaningful way. But again, we are we're steps from that yet. Okay. And just a second follow up. So if it's being taken out of the rotation, the class mm -hmm. rotation, does that mean there's now a gap? There's a space in the schedule that's, that's in, empty? We're looking okay. at, well, do you want me to start and you jump in? We're looking at scheduling right now because the demands that we have, we have phys ed and health and we have technology, tech ed, is that the right term, tech ed? Uh, we have art and we have drama and we have world language and we have um, chorus and we have uh, band and orchestra and we have intervention time so the and freeing up of any time in our schedule is not a bad thing because it allows us to do something more deeply or to um, expand on do you want to sure. so, so the, the way oh, sorry and again, this is a work in progress, yeah. the schedule. No, I understand yeah. it's fluid. Yeah. Yes, so, you know that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so by having physical education move into the exploratory rotation yeah. as, mm -hmm. as it is, take that space of where we hold children, yeah. it's actually increasing the amount of time. Um, I've talked about academic study with you folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, happens two days a week for every child for for. Uh, uh, four core teachers and half their team. This move is going to expand that time for every child will have academic study potentially four days a week. Okay, So it's going to allow us to think differently about our use of time in the four core. Mm -hmm. This was kind of an unintended consequence, but a very positive consequence because we're feeling like we need more time in our four core and around intervention. Mm -hmm. So the next step as we move forward is to be thinking about how we do that really effectively um, to intervene uh, oh, yeah. in those places. So this allows one of the effects is actually a positive one. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Betsy. Ann? Great. Um, I just wanted to add about the, the physical education that, you know, comparing it to elementary school isn't really um, a fair comparison that it's the same amount of time because in elementary, the kids <coughs> do get to go outside and the ones who need to run around, run around. They can get their hearts racing. Um, so it's a little different. And it, and it is sad that they don't, they, they wouldn't have that same experience, but right. at least there's a positive. Well, and we have some plans, but we just need some money for the other plans that we have around options for running around during the day and after school as well. Um, and can I digress for one second? And I and I have a mother from Sweden who tells me, and when she goes to, in, when she was in school, that between every single class they open up all the windows and every kid goes outside and has to run around for a couple minutes. So I actually personally like that idea, but I'm not sure if that you know would fly. <laughs> but um, all kinds of options, and we're going to look at this. I'm, my question's been answered. Thanks. Awesome. Michael? Um, in terms of the academic reductions, yes. there's the English, social studies, et cetera, et cetera, without getting into places you don't want to go. But you said that you know the reductions are some positions, some shifting in assignments. So can you just give a texture of what this whole list of academic reductions is? That's what I want to say. Okay. <laughs> so, That's what I want to yeah, I need to see the total reductions of, of FTE is 14.4 FTE. So it's pieces of people or people. So we can't, the, the challenge again in this conversation is that when, if you're reducing a point whatever in English, where does that person go? And by contract, there's lots of moving pieces that happen. So who, who this actually affects does not happen for a, a period of time yet. Um, I don't know if that, does that help? Um, marginally. Maybe not? Not really. Okay. Um, you want to try again? Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. Try to put it together, Michael, I'll yeah. go to someone else in the meantime. Shabazz? So, of the 845,575, does this array 
of reductions plus addition, I presume already written in, bring us to zero? Are we still looking at a gap? So, Rob, can I have the packets? Because let's hand those out, too, so people can see those pages. So, at this moment, <coughs> given the information we have, we have an undefined amount, which is typically addressed through <coughs> staff turnover savings of about 60-something thousand. So, at this point, I believe the gap is met. Again, over the next four weeks, I, I things shift a little bit. So at this moment, the gap is closed, but in using an additional 100,000 B and D, and um, you'll get to see what those reductions look like. So if you turn, this is kind of the detailed at the moment. It's not, um, again, it's hard to be, you don't want to identify too much, but if you find the page that's 41 and 42, mm -hmm. So you see the increases that we, mm -hmm. we saw before. Um, you see the two additions. Mm -hmm. And then on the back page is where you see the reductions playing out with dollars attached. Mm -hmm. So at this moment, mm -hmm. we, we realize the goal. And um, I have used as many prepayments and you know, reallocation of funds that I potentially can use. And now mm -hmm. we are at the place of if we <coughs> have a greater gap, um, there's nowhere really else to go. Shabash, mm -hmm. <coughs> you have to want to follow up on that? Um, you want to come back? The other thing I had was whether food services no longer has an administrative person. Um, uh -huh. That person is now. Um, through the com the company that the corporation that we contract with, mm -hmm. we do maintain a clerical person connected mm -hmm. to that, but the cost um, is paid to this corporation at this point. And mm -hmm. the RFP um, is in the process this year, so we'll con consider whether this is where we remain for the next so many years in this type of an arrangement or not. So that, that would affect the FY14, depending on who we contract with, this whole budget scenario? Yeah, it would, because our, we're up at the end of this year, Rob, for our, yes. So we're building in, kind of based on where we are now. Exactly. Hoping that we do that. And I'd love to see a situation where we're actually spending less money. Mm. You know, but mm. we're trying to be realistic. Michael? Um, I don't know if I succeeded. I'll come back. You want to try? Because okay. okay. well, I can also, you know, Mickey can talk about the pieces too in a way that might make more sense. Maybe I'm not sure. answering it in a way that helps. Are you okay? Um, I wouldn't mind another explanation, but I can okay. yield to someone else. Catherine? It, it's just um, as I look yep. at, um, again, the, the yep. phys ed teacher at the middle school, so I understand that that's getting reduced. Mm -hmm. um, but you're adding in, um, additional health classes? At this point, we are looking at the schedule to determine how we can actually make that happen. Because right now, health at the middle school is, is taught in science, in phys ed, and one day a week on a rotational schedule by guidance counselors. Did I hit that right? Um, so what we're trying to do is to remove some of the health that's taught within phys ed and some of these other locations to really have a much more mm -hmm. concentrated curriculum that's consistently taught to all students. Okay. It's how we can make that happen in the schedule is what we're still looking at. So embed it more fully. More in fully science, and, more ex and more explicit. So okay. it could be a total separate course around health that might be in a rotation. We're trying to figure out how this plays out in the schedule. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Two, two other quick ones. One is um, it doesn't seem like we're necessarily cutting electives anywhere or having to raise the number of people who sign up to do an elective. That's, is that true? That's one question. Mm -hmm. And the other question is what's the latest on the semester versus trimester <coughs> discussion? So I can speak to um, the schedule conversation. I think maybe if Mickey could say something about the specials. But the schedule conversation, this is an ongoing conversation that you saw me reference in one of the slides, if it wasn't terribly explicit. The use of time, we are, um, I am um, in the process of and having conversations around how we explore um, what is the best model for instruction over the course of a school year, um, how do we embed um, uh, collaboration time for adults. 
um, and how do we make sure that we have the model that works for all students. Um, I'm steering clear of the conversation of whether that is a trimester or a semester. I'm, I have certain um, expectations which are collaboration, consistent instructional time over the course of a year so there's no gaps in instruction. What that might look like is the, the scheduling discussion that will happen with, um, within the parameters of our, of our contract. So in terms of the elective question, can you just repeat? I want to make uh, sure I understand what you're... Are we reducing electives and the way I think we did it in the past was raise the level of participants that you needed to run the class. And raise so the class size. Yeah. Yeah, right. So what we're doing, so we've already, we feel like we've raised class size to the extent that we cannot offer the course in a meaningful way if we increase that. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we took a look at all of the electives that we're offering and we looked for opportunities to combine. So one example um, that I know Mark put in front of the high school was acting one and two. So right now they, we offer acting one and two as two separate sections. And so next year we're going to do much like we do in art where acting one and two are going to be combined in the same class and so we already took a look at um, our enrollments currently and we already see areas where we could make some co consolidations today if our enrollment doesn't change so does that answer yep okay and so I think I might have an answer okay. to your question <laughs> um, so right now we have last last time we looked we had about 25 percent of the high school staff were already decimal points so they, they already weren't 1.0. And so in our major academic departments, we're running on average about 88 sections of classes for English and social studies. So we're simply saying that going forward, we're going to run 84 sections. And so in some cases, if we have a retirement, we might um, ask people in those departments who are not currently full time to assume more so that we don't have to hire for that retirement. So that's how we're able to do the decimal points at the high school. So that, that's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mickey. <laughs> And, you know, I also, if I could, I'm sorry, and also financially, you know, for the district it is, um, in the long run, um, there's a conversation to be had around part-time versus full-time, and it's helpful in those cases to be able to have full-time staff versus part-time staff for the legacy costs that we incur um, from having part-time people. So, but thank you, Mickey. She, she understands the scheduling talk. <laughs> I would never have gotten there. Right, you all set? Any other comments or questions? Um, and make a, a comment, Please. a couple of questions. Um, I, I've told you before, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I want to say it again publicly, I think one of the, the steps that you've taken that I'm most pleased with um, is the creation of the family liaison. Um, the few years that I've been on the school committee, the regional school committee, I've um, certainly become more aware of the efforts that first Michael Hayes and now Betsy and, and Mike Malone and, and Mark and Diane and, and Mickey have made to open up the doors wider for inclusion in both buildings, which I think has been a problem for a long, long time. And I think that the progress that um, they are making in, in opening the doors of welcome, if you will, to a very culturally diverse community is, is uh, to be applauded. I think this is a step that adds to that. Um, Having said that, um, because of the controversy over administration and everything, I think it does behoove us to look very carefully mm -hmm. at what progress will be made over the next couple of years in that regard. But I, yeah. I think, if I may, it's, it's, a, it's a step that you've taken that I'm, I'm personally very, very Thank pleased you. with. Um, my, my question um, uh, goes to um, clarification on the summer school situation. Mm -hmm. um, last fall, we were given a report on the um, summer school experience from last year that was very po positive and very glowing. This, what you've done here, how does that impact that, well, it if at all? It will, it maintains, it will maintain. Yeah, it maintains what we've offered in the past. We've not made reductions okay. to Okay, so to that program staff. stays intact in yes. terms of providing an opportunity for kids who may be yes. in need of intervention. And yeah, and I think, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, and I think there's also conversation about how we can be creative with the use of time during the summer to support students who need credit recovery or, um, you know, um, need some level of, I think, partnering with the PRISM after school and summer program enrichment. But I also think we want to start to think about how we use models to help support students to, um, 
who are, are struggling academically in, say, mathematics to have another opportunity to bulk up. Uh, that may not be for this year, but I'm, I'm very interested in hearing how we can create opportunities for um, raising students up from where they're sitting right now academically to become um, stronger in a content area. So it is not only about credit recovery for me, it's about also um, filling gaps and supporting students to move on to the next um, level. So that, that's not threatened at all here? No. no. Okay. My last question has to do with um, a quote from, um, bear with me for just a second please if I find my notes here. Um, if you could explain, in, in steps that you're taking in, in one of the panels, you, you talk about creating and implementing steps for greater differentiation. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a little in more detail about what that means? Sure. I mean, some right now is, if you look at the, um, the plan between Jerry Champagne and Faye Brady around how you're integrating technology into the classroom and creating that um, expert group within a school, is in itself an opportunity and a way for people to become more expert in differentiation. Other conversations <coughs> that um, Rhonda and Ian and Mike are having with principals and staff around how are we creating curriculum um, and using materials that have um, the opportunity to either extend or um, to support struggling students within a curriculum. So any curricular decisions that we're making need to have those explicit um, requirements built in. For example, at the elementary level when we looked at a math textbook, we're looking at a, a textbook that can is proven to be su uh, supportive and effective for the student populations that we have sitting in front of us and allowing us to um, differentiate. And it's built in because we don't want teachers to have to think about, well, how am I doing, how am I going to, to modify these materials, in, if, if at all possible. We know that we are still there, and we are still asking teachers to modify. So there's going to be a level of uh, professional development. I know Mark has taken on some of the differentiation work at the high school already, um, and they've had conversations this year. And I know, I believe they've written, I don't know if it's in the AEF grant as well for differentiation, or is that just the equity work? I'm looking at you. Yeah. Mr. Jackson, the differentiation work that you did at the high school level this year. Did you write that for the AEF grant for next year? Okay. So the, the conversation is how do you um, have that level of conversation, providing resources, of course, curriculum materials that are easily differentiated um, by teachers, but also how do you create opportunities for teachers, teams of teachers to work together and to talk about the student population sitting in front of them and to be able to rely on their colleagues to help with differentiation. Some of that is with Betsy building in the intervention time. Your ability across teams to reteach, pre-teach um, is greatly enhanced by creating those opportunities and um, creating the time for adults to sit together and to talk about using actual data to inform um, their decisions for the next day. Right now, we are not quite there with the use of data, and that is our rolling out of next year's plan. So it's a, I would say it's multifaceted. There's some embedded professional development. The high school's taken on some of that work this year. There's also um, the work at the system level around using um, data to inform instruction and how does that play out in collaborative teams. And then there are specific strategies and interventions like um, using technology to um, implement and then Rhonda is all over differentiation when she's looking at curriculum materials with people and how do we teach our, our students in all content areas. <coughs> That's a long-winded answer for probably. That's fine, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Catherine? I, I, yeah, it, talking about the summer sort of um, uh, brought this back to me and, and Rick had asked a question about the schedule as well, particularly at the high school. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that concerns me, and I think concerns members of the community, is that we are now really starting to, I think, develop programs and pay very close attention to and prioritize kids who have historically been underserved. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that, um, when I think about the schedule, um, I worry about gaps in um, instruction for kids and sort of the loss of gains that they make. Mm -hmm. And I think about it in terms of both during the school year but also in the yeah. summer. Yeah. Um, kids who don't have access to, you know, uh, 
enrichment programs mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Or um, so I just want to really sure. keep that in mind, um, both in terms of what we're offering in the summer, who has access to it, um, but as we think about the schedule during the school year as well, because you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not an educator, but I can certainly understand that you can lose a lot of ground if there are, you know, three-month gaps, six-month gaps, and um, I sort of feel like, you know, we're, we're making gains over here, mm -hmm. or kids can make gains over here, but right. they're going to have losses over here, so I'd like to get Could it I? all. Would you mind? No. Um, so I just, I would like to say that um, it can't be a choice. It has to be that we're obligated to meet the needs of each and every child. So I think we all sit with that and we are not there yet. So we do have to pay particular attention and it would be irresponsible for us not to. So part of the, the schedule conversations are how do you build in what you know is evidence-based that's going to make a difference for improving the ability of your teachers to differentiate and meet the needs of every child and opportunities for students to have you know, double exposure to a content area or to have direct intervention during the school day. And you'll notice that our, our cuts do not include cutting summer services. Um, so it's a multifaceted approach. And for me, I believe you can do both well. You can maintain what we value and meet the needs of all of your students because that's what public school is all about and we're supposed to do this. So to, to ignore um, a, a large population of our, our students is um, irresponsible and um, just wrong. So we are keeping an eye on what are our commitments and what are our priorities. And some of the hard conversations will have to come and not at the cost of maintaining and holding what we really value for all of our kids. Clearly, we value the arts and we value, um, you know, athletics and all of the things that kids hook on to. And we have to have kind of where are we going as, as a school district, um, a very large conversation. I believe we can maintain both and meet that challenge. Can I say one thank you? I just want to, I do want to say, and I, I know I said this in Amherst as well, I do want to thank the administrative team because this is a really difficult, long <coughs> process and um, very difficult because they're having the hard conversations which, with people that they work with day in and day out. Um, so I want to recognize their dedication and their commitment and their hard work um, and the, and the hard work of our faculty and staff who are receiving these messages and, and focusing every single day on our kids. Um, so it, it's, it's such a team effort and, and the community is strong. So I, I thank you all. Thank you. Um, I realized, Zoe, I didn't want to forget you and if you had any comment from the student perspective on what we've been talking about this evening. Um, I mean, I... Just, I guess, a few things from just student, my perspective anyway, I don't know about other people. I mean, I know that students as a whole, we, we realize that there is a gap that needs to be looked at. Um, and I don't know, I mean, you guys are going to talk about it. I don't know if it's that opportunities aren't being given or kids aren't choosing to, to step, take the steps forward. Um, and I guess you just have to talk about that. Um, and then I think the thing with the technology, I'll be honest, I work at the middle school with the band program and all those kids have like iPhones and I don't have an, I don't like know anything about <laughs> iPhones and they're sitting there like with their iPhones. I think that, and I took, I took computer um, when I was in middle school and I don't, I think that um, when I took it, I don't remember anything we did in it being really um, kind of helpful. I don't know. I think that, <laughs> I think if, I think Be if. Be honest. Would yeah. you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think if you could tweak it to potentially yeah. have a really good impact, because I think there are things that kids have to learn with mm -hmm. technology that will be useful. Um, but I think that kids also learn a lot of that um, outside of school. I know I've learned a lot outside of school. I've learned a lot from friends. Um, I've learned a lot just in class from teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and like about the databases, you learn that from teachers and from the librarians. Um, so oh, yeah, say. so I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think it's I don't think it's as big of a issue if you get rid of it. And then I I don't know when it changed when the health program changed because mm -hmm. when I was in middle school we, again we had a separate health class. Mm -hmm. um, 
which I think was beneficial. I think that it is important to have health in middle school as well as high school. Um, and then in terms of athletics and exercise, I completely agree. Like, you know, elementary school, one of the biggest things that people were saying when we went to middle school was, oh my God, no more recess. How are we going to survive? <laughs> and even I remember in spring, yeah, we would mm -hmm. go outside for just half an hour during lunch and it would make a big difference. Like we would be more attentive when we went in. Um, and I think just um, maybe sculpting PE classes, even here, getting more physical activity. Because um, I feel like at the high school, there's actually less physical activity in the PE classes than at the middle school. Um, so it's just a few things. That was Thank a you. lot of Thank great things much. to say. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Michael. I just have a question about process. So we have, this is the public hearing, so we're supposed to then vote on it at some point. So I guess the question is, what's the date for doing it and the request that we see whatever we're being asked to vote on at least a week before we vote? <laughs> Yeah, what is our, um, all right, hold on. I might have it with me, the date. Scheduled in March. Um, week, second week in March. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, vote is March 12th. Right. Yes. So, so you're asking for stuff uh, a week in March advance. 5th. Yep. That like in our hands. Pardon? In our hands, not yeah. mailed on the 5th. So they actually can digest it for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please. Um, along along those lines. You're so nice. Um, <laughs> I think this is this it's isn't the first time that, <laughs> that that concern has has uh, been raised about having materials sufficiently in advance so that they can be studied and processed and plans can be made for coming to the meeting um, fully prepared as as we all should be. Um, I think that's always been the intent of, um, <coughs> of central office. Um, there are times such as now um, when um, events can be overwhelming. Um, I also believe that when it's parallel with the regionalization efforts that that complicates things as well. Having said all of that, um, I think that your point about timeliness of materials is certainly Especially the, the budget vote. Uh, uh, it's certainly in need sure. of being respected and adhered to, and I'm sure every effort on the part of central office will be made to do that, Michael. Okay, thank you. And, and now so comes sure. thank you. Yes. <laughs> so the, um, the thing that's really helpful now is if there's input from the committee, you know, questions um, to get them to me in a, you know, over the next mm -hmm. period of time, because we'd be happy to answer any of that up front, because the next um, conversation will be um, the vote of the, the bottom line budget. So we want to make sure that we fully answer questions that you might have. Um, and again, I don't foresee substantial changes in these ads and cuts, but there will be some movement um, between now and then. But again, input is welcome <coughs> and the community as well to, to raise questions. Um, and then, you know, as I, I did mention in Amherst, and I've done the same in Pelham, it, these are difficult decisions that in the end you know, I will hopefully put a plan in, in, in front of people that will move our district's work forward, um, and then I will ask the, the committee to, to vote that for us, um, and hopefully the four towns can support their assessments. If I may add just Please. one more thing to my response to that, Michael. I think it's important, um, not here during a, 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 our business meeting, but perhaps on your own, if, you, if you're not already as an individual fully cognizant of some of the state laws and contractual language which um, creates the, the boundaries within which this whole discussion takes place and preparation takes place, I think it would be useful for each member of the committee to uh, become knowledgeable about what those state laws and their dates, the contract language, when people have to be notified of potential layoffs, that kind of informs the overall process. And so if if you're not aware of that, I think it would be helpful if you became aware of it and better understand the, the pressures on everyone involved, not just central office, but even the people who are impacted by cuts. Um, they're waiting, you know, when is the shoe going to drop? Um, that's not a very pleasant situation to be in. So I think it would be important if you're not already familiar with what those dates are um, to, to um, in, in take advantage of an opportunity to, um, to become more aware of that. I think that would be helpful to everyone. Can I also add one sure. more? Just um, 
And again, we will do our absolute best to get that to people in advance. And, and I have to say, it's, uh, in addition to the staff, um, the contractual obligations of timeline, we're also meeting the timeline of uh, multiple communities. So the timeline this year is, is extremely tight, the calendar, so that the turnaround time between meetings of Amherst Pelham region is really tight and the four town meetings and you know so there's a lot going on right now that this year it's, it's really been um, quite honestly much more challenging to turn around the information in a timely way and um, I missed Amherst select uh, the finance committee meeting the other night because I was double booked for Pelham school committee meeting so there are like there's unfortunately it's it's very 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 tight the multiple audiences we have to honestly serve in a, in a good way to keep informed along the way um, but we will do our best thank you and thank you to the staff for um, all of your your hard work too and continued hard work for the rest of the year miss mm -hmm. Tileman uh, just one question. sure would someone comment on what is the plan for OPEB financing next year and in the future I did it we could put it on for our next discussion with the budget, but we weren't prepared to talk about that tonight. She's. Um, oh, do you want me to just say, so Mary Lou, it's not part of our agenda tonight for the OPEB finance, uh, or how are we supporting or meeting that obligation, but we could put it on for our next budget discussion and talk about o OPEB. It is not factored into uh, this budget projection for um, next year at all. I'd be happy to, if the chair would like me to, I'd be happy to have Rob discuss that, <coughs> absolutely. If the chair would is, is, so inclined. Is that next meeting satisfactory for you? Whenever it fits conveniently into your uh, meeting. Uh, but if you're not going to do it uh, for next year, then at some point, I'd like to know when you'll be talking sure. about it. It doesn't have to be the next meeting. Um, okay. What if um, we were to have a conversation away from this meeting and then report back on that conversation, which may include uh, including another the agenda for next time? Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Thank Mary you. Lou. Thank you. Any other comments or questions about the budget? Okay, again, thank you very, very much to the staff, um, and um, I suspect a good evening. Um, um, why don't we um, take a, a minute break while people get up to um, depart and people can take care of their own individual business? A couple of minutes. Okay, good. Suspended. By order of the chair. Thank you.
gifts and, and also the calendar. Um, I think we need an update on that as well. There are a few things that are kind of um, uncertain about. Um, but um, first order of business as we reconvene is to um, take a look at the sheet identifying the gifts and I will entertain a motion to um, accept these really remarkably generous gifts from members of our community. Um, is there a motion? I move that we accept the uh, uh, donations uh, from Terry Ray and Margot Mace, uh, from Cheryl and Kenneth Oaks, uh, Jones Group Realtors, Richard and Catherine Lawler, Stans Ziamek, and Matthew and Julie Emerson, and Francis Caparella, and uh, apologies for any mispronunciation. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of accepting the gifts, please raise your hand. And it's accepted unanimously. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are um, close to the end of the formal part of our meeting, or the open session. Take a look at the calendar, please. And I'm going to ask um, Maria if she could give us an update. In particular, I had on my calendar for today, for example, school choice and calendar. Um, where do those go in, right. in the future? I think Debbie has some adjustments that we were talking about on dates. Can we talk about that a little bit? And then we do have sure. to reschedule some. Sure. We also will need to talk about calendar, but we've been, Amherst and Pelham discussions really kind of drive okay. some of our calendar Is it best not to put that in anywhere? Or? No, I think we probably could, but it might be, um, we'll have to talk about what the date might, okay. what date might be appropriate. And Debbie could probably. Um, well, for the calendar, I would hope if, Ms. Major thinks we can get everything out and get uh, feedback from APEA in time. I'd love to be able to present that at the, the uh, first March regional okay. meeting. March. Um, okay. And I had planned to work on that today. It didn't happen, but hopefully tomorrow. <laughs> um, a little busy. One question that um, Dr. Rhonda Cohen has requested, she schedules to present the teaching and learning update at the joint meeting in March, which is scheduled for March 26th. That is actually, she didn't realize when we were talking about it initially, that's the second night of Passover. Mm -hmm. She will not be available that night. So her proposal, if you would consider it, is to flip the Amherst meeting in March with the joint meeting. That way you can have the joint meeting on the 19th of March. She could present the teaching and learning update, and then Amherst could meet on the 26th, if that's acceptable. I, if I may, I, I personally would appreciate that switch um, mm -hmm. if we could pull it off. Sure. So the question is for the committee, instead of meeting on the joint meeting on March 26th, could you meet and have the joint meeting on March 19th? Right. And then hmm. Amherst on the 26th. And then Amherst sure. would be the 26th. So it's just really flopping the dates. Sure. But Are there Amherst any, is kind of here. Any yeah. problems Basically. with that switch <laughs> at all? I'm fine with that. Is that okay? Well, yes, any I objections can. at all? I don't have anything with And Michael, that's okay. I think, is the only other person oh, yeah, to check. No, I'm okay. Yeah. You're okay, Michael? Okay. okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, then we'll make that okay. switch. The, the joint goes to the 19th and the Amherst meeting goes to the 26th. Okay. And so along with that you means know, I'm changing it right now. that yeah, I'll make sure you get there. <laughs> um, Dr. Cohen's yeah. presentation will be on the 19th? Yes, that's correct. And where does that leave school choice vote? I think what we'll probably want to do is we'll do the calendar on March 12th. And then I would want to enrollments, Kathy. We can do an up, up, enrollment update, and I think we'll have a recommendation. Okay. By the 12th. On the 12th. Yep. And then we would be able to vote the following, or can we? Are we? Law says you have to have a school choice public, public hearing. hearing. Okay, so, so we'd vote. Okay, so we do uh, choice on the 12th. No, we do the enrollment update on the 12th, and, and we the would do the. Hearing. Oh, and then the vote on the 19th. Vote on the 19th. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else about the calendar that we should? Um, we're still in March. We could go to April. No, what, uh, quick question. Yeah. The, sure. The twelfth you were just talking about. What month are we talking? March. 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 Okay. Um, so March one thing 19. that. Um, and we can update this and get it out to people too. Maybe Debbie and I could do that tomorrow. Yeah. Even though we have, um, who knows how many feet of snow out there, and it's still only the middle of February. Um, I'd like the committee to think about retreat at the end of the school year. Um, if you could at least sort of 
think a few months down the road <coughs> when sometime in June um, that might be um, good for you um, and we can talk about that maybe slowly as the, as the rest of the year unfolds. Mm -hmm. I really think that that's something that we should plan on doing as a, as a group. What and are we thinking of, like a two-hour session, an evening session? Well, that's something we can talk about. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Okay. It depends upon what the committee feels it needs and wants. Um, we could go two hours. We could go full day. Um, okay. it, it really depends upon what we as a group decide. <laughs> Lawrence's expression is not in favor. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I don't want to preclude any any possibility or any option. Uh, I think it's it really it should be up to the the members of the committee. Somehow or other, we can figure out a process to decide how to to come to a conclusion. Is what what do we need as a group to um, to uh, cool, function yeah. more effectively, more efficiently, um, more collegially? If that's mm -hmm. something that people feel a need for, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think it's something that we should plan on sometime in June. Okay. So if you could give that some thought. Anything else, Maria? No, I think no? that's it. Um, then if not, um, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session for purposes of um, discussing strategy with respect to uh, the superintendent's contract. Collective bargaining is authorized by Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21, Paragraph 3. And to discuss the discipline or dismissal of a public employee or staff member is authorized by Mass General Law Chapter A, Section 21, Paragraph 1, not to return to regular session. May I have such a motion? So moved. Second. Second. And we need to go. Take your aye. Foley aye. Hood aye. Baptiste aye. O'Brien aye. Shabazz aye. Coffee eye. Fonch eye. We are adjourned. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> All right, well, it's always fun, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe.